off rep. Superstars Media. To a human being being sliced into two. Can you imagine such a thing? Biafra is going to emerge as a nation. You know, despite the support of Britain, Russia, Egypt, and some other friends of Nigeria, we all will surely come out as a nation because we are fighting a just cause. Even a little child on the street will tell you this. We shall never go back to Nigeria again. God's grace will surely emerge as a nation. And so, as far as this war continues, we'll fight to the last man. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Biafran Golden Child. Thank you. Um, good morning all, uh, good afternoon, good evening. I um, hope you're all feeling fine. I uh, hope you're all doing good in your respective uh, places of abode. Yes, I'm once again happy to, you know, make my random thoughts uh, uh, known to uh, my interested uh, viewers. Um, you know, super glad uh, once again that I um, have the opportunity to make this address via the Biafra Superstar Media. And um, it's always a good thing and always a happy moment for me when I, you know, communicate or interact with my people, you know, freedom lovers of the world, lovers of the Igbo, and the hopeful uh, citizens of uh, the United States of Biafra. You know, yes, I'm mighty glad that this name has become uh, suddenly very, you know, it's become commonplace. For today, I want to discuss briefly about um, uh, Britain, uh, Britain and its so-called successful elections. I mean, the elections that were just, um, you know, it, it rounded up a few days ago in which uh, your uh, Kia Stammer, you know, won and, uh, you know, defeated uh, the erstwhile uh, Prime Minister woefully and bitterly. Yes, um, uh, my thoughts about it may surprise a lot of people, you know, because what I'm about to say, yes, I congratulate the new uh, Prime Minister, but I can't help but make some observations. And so for the purpose of um, this uh, audio, I'm going to call this uh, my topic today, the hypocrisy of Britain. The hypocrisy of Britain. Yes, the hypocrisy of Britain. Yes, you might wonder why I decided to use such uh, a harsh term to describe uh, a great country like uh, Britain. There was once uh, Great Britain. Yeah, the truth of the matter is, when you look at what Britain has done to Africa, when you look at what Britain is doing to Africa, what you, when you look at what Britain did to Africa from the very beginning, from the initial contact with African people, and um, you look at what they are doing today to even so-called, uh, you know, uh, neo-colonized people, colonized and neo-colonial people. I mean, people who have given their independence from Britain. You know, you begin to agree with me that uh, there seems to be a double standard, so to speak. There seems to be um, what I might call a deliberate attempt to, you know, uh, stifle and uh, put these people in a regressive, in a retrogressive uh, condition. I mean, there seems to be a deliberate uh, pattern you know, whereby even though these people have gotten their independence from Britain, they are still put in a condition, they are forced to be in a condition where they will still continue to suck make, so to speak, like a child that, uh, you know, has not grown, that is still, I mean, a grown baby who should have uh, a stewed sucking his mother's breast, but at every time he's running back there, you know, to suck all the mom. I mean, it's uh, very, very unfortunate. Let me say how it is. You see, uh, since the amount, okay, let me use Nigeria as an example. 
uh, from the amalgamation of Nigeria as a single entity where the North and the South were brought together to form one nation. There has been a deliberate attempt by Britain for whatever reasons, you know, it has. There has been a deliberate attempt by Britain to make one group, to make one region, you know, super above the other regions. Uh, Britain from the onset seemed to have, you know, developed a, a, a criminal law, a pathological law, you know, uh, for the Northern region, such that um, from the very beginning, they treated the North with every level of, you know, love, with every level of care, with every level of tender, tenderness, you know, unlike other regions. I mean, the North were told, the food and the North were told, you know, from the very on, you know, onset, right from 1914, when the Mamaganation took place, they were told that they were born to rule. They were born to rule, you know, and uh, this uh, kind of uh, indoctrination, this kind of, um, you know, uh, teaching has equally was fully imbibed by the Fulanese. And uh, over the years, despite how long it has been, the Fulanese have continued to propagate that belief, that conviction that yes, they were truly born to rule. And so at any point in time, even though Nigeria had been amalgamated, even though Nigeria was now one country, one entity, one sovereign nation, the North, the Fulani, that is, you know, always in charge of the North, that is always superior, so to speak, in every ramification within the North, has always insisted they were born to rule and they should determine who steps into the, you know, ladder of power at any point in time in Nigeria. And so I begin to look at other countries that had gone through the tutelage, the colonialism of the British Empire. And I discover that just like what is happening in Nigeria, there has been a very deliberate effort to make the Fulani, the Arch Muslims, superior to other regions in that country. I mean, is it in Ghana? Is it Liberia? Is it in uh, any part? Of, just look at any country that has been colonized by Britain, you see a certain, you know, sing, you know, a seemingly preference, you know, a preference for the Fulani, no matter how, you know, many they are, no matter how few they are, there has been that deliberate policy of the British government to put them, set them aside and give them every opportunity to enhance hands themselves to dominate others, to subjugate others, and to have this uh, feeling of, uh, you know, the megalomanianism. They feel like they were born to rule, to use the terms of, uh, you know, the Fulani people. So back to Nigeria. It was very, very alarming. I found it particularly alarming that when initially, 1956 or thereabout, when Antonio Nahoro, one of the nationalists, moved, you know, the, the motion for Nigeria's uh, independence from colonial rule, that the North said, no, we don't want this, we are not ready yet. The British people told the North that if you go in at this point, you'll be relegated to the background. And so they supported the Northern elements, especially the Fulani people, to say, no, we are not ready. We could have gotten our independence 1956 and not 1960. They said they were not ready. Imagine a country that was on the verge of getting its independence. I mean, finally you say, I don't, I'm not going to be part of this anymore. I'm not going to be a colonial empire, any, a colonized empire anymore. My independence is at hand. I can for once, for once be a sovereign nation. But they said they were not ready. And so they took Nigeria backwards again okay, until 1960, when they willy-nilly, on one condition, that they should be the ones who are at helm of affairs. And that was why we had uh, somebody like Tafa Balewa, you know, becoming the uh, prime minister, while our, you know, erudite and, uh, you know, savvy, politically active, you know, indefatigable. Dr. Namdi Azikiwe became a figurehead president. You know, 
a mere, you know, a figurehead, so to speak. So uh, when I see Britain, for instance, what is happening in recent times, the whole world is, you know, uh, happy for them. They are screaming. They've gotten it right. Now, uh, Keir Starmer has won it. Yes, things are going to change. Our election back to back has been a success. There's no no stories of rigging. There's no stories of killings. There's no stories of uh, brutal uh, manipulations. There's no uh, electoral, uh, you know, manipulations and all that. And you begin to wonder what happens in my dear country, Nigeria. Why is it that in Nigeria we have never gotten it wrong? Why are our elections always flawed? Why are our elections always fraught with deceits, with disappointments, with manipulations, with riggings, even from the highest level of, of electoral process, the INEC? Why is it that our, our political leaders, especially those who want to, who are vying for the post of presidents, who want to be a president, why are they always retired, required? at a certain point of a level of their preparations, why are they required to go to Chatham House in London? What do they do at Chatham House when they go to be addressed by the British, their former British uh, 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 colonists or co colonizers? What do they discuss with these leaders? Where do they handpick as if they are making a selection, as if it has a, a deliberate attempt to select, you know, who would do their bidding better? Why do they go to Chatham House, every presidential candidate? I think we should reason about this. What do they tell them there? And then by the time they come back, they are invited again. And if you make it twice or thrice to Chatham House, of course, you should know you'll be the next president of this country. Anyhow it is, you eventually win. Is that not hypocrisy? I mean, here is Britain. You know, glamorizing the, the election that has brought, you know, Keir Starmer into the office. I mean, he's now, you know, moving, you know, into the full uh, authority of the Prime Minister of uh, Britain in an election that they all judge as free and fair. Why does it not happen in their former colonies? Why are our elections fraught with rigging, with manipulations? with stomach infrastructure? Why are the richest people, those who can pay more, who can buy the votes? Why is, why is it that those who can bribe uh, the INEC, the highest you know, elector, election uh, controlling body, why is it that the highest bidder is always the winner? Preferably, and always, always in the case, is either a Muslim or is a Fulani or has, you know, both within him. So this, this kind of uh, attitude is, to the best of my mind, uh, a, a hypocrisy of the worst type. I mean, this is a country, Great Britain is a country that make their own country as habitable as possible. But they force their modern day slave mentality on their ex-colonial territories. They're just like the Fulanis, you know, the Fulani is vagabonding around Africa, and you wonder why they love the Fulanis who bow to their wives and capricious systems of power. The Stockholm's colonial masters are still very much alive. This is why the case of Namdekanu has turned the whole world. If they don't get their way, they will force the entire country like Nigeria into stagnation. It's a facade one. You might not understand this. You might, and maybe you've never thought about it from this angle. But the truth of the matter is that anything that concerns Nigeria, especially the whole Nigeria, especially the wealth of this country, especially the leadership of the political leadership of this country, especially, you know, how to share the resources of this country, especially, you know, uh, coming together, planning, to take this country to the next level, Britain always suddenly appears. It appears as an umpire, but I wouldn't say an unbiased umpire. It appears as an umpire. It superintends and it begins to delegate. It begins to arrogate. It begins to select who and who, where and where 
this thing should go over the years. It hurts me. It hurts me really. And when the Britain came into this country, the Igbos, the South, were those who received them with pomp and pageantry. I mean, we embraced, not only embraced their religion, we also accepted their education. I mean, we were ready and vigorously in pursuit of what they had to offer. Our people excelled academically. Our people became priests and pastors, you know, and clergy. But what has happened today? Rather than receive these people who received you wholeheartedly, peacefully, who embraced you, who climbed and sinker, what have they done? They go back, they fall back to the full and the north. They fall back to those few, you know, uh, masters, those who did never, never accepted their religion, those who never accepted their education. And they fell back to them and still chose them as their choice in anything in Nigeria. As far as Britain was concerned, the north, the full and the north, are the only people they recognize in Nigeria. Because, of course, they found them very easy to manipulate. They found them very amenable to their whims and caprices. They found them a ready tool to use because of their feudal system. Because they know when an Emir speaks, every other person is silent. They know when a Saudana speaks, every other person is silent. And they knew they had this, you know, uh, how do you put it? A sort of... Uh, Command, command from the top. It comes from the command, it's issued down, and everybody obeys hook, line, and sinker. You obey before uh, command. Hook, line, and sinker. But not so for the South. Because, of course, the Igbo people, especially the South, in Igbo land, we pride ourselves that we have no king. Igbo Emweze. We pride ourselves that every man succeeds when he works hard when he decides you know you know to, to to push his destiny across without looking at any other person in local parlance we say Ike Otuonye. Ike Otuonye. one man's effort he fights his way vigorously there's nobody to call a king there's nobody to rush to there's nobody to be vassal to you move on don't submit to any person your god move on and you succeed do your normal job Work hard. Success is coming. Be consistent in what you're doing. That's what the man believes in. But not so for the full and the not. This is a place where when the Emir is standing up, when the Emir is walking, every other person kneels down and bows down to an Emir. So the British love this. They love this because when they came, you know, they saw people, you know, who didn't Resist who were amenable to their divide and rule tactics, not the South, not the South, even though we embrace their religion, even though we embrace their culture, even though we took their education, even though we took everything they brought to us and jettisoned what we had, the British still didn't love us. Yes, they didn't love us. It was a wasted effort, a very wasted effort. Let's look at men. The, the case of our, you know, leader Mazen Namdekanu. Let's consider his plight. Namdekanu is a British citizen. Has it occurred to anybody here that the British, Britain, has not made any statement since his unfortunate arrest in Kenya and his extradition back to Nigeria? Nobody, everybody has condemned it. Britain has not said anything. A British citizen is in the gullas, is in the zoo called the DSS Distension. A British citizen was forcefully arrested and deported, extradited back to Nigeria. You know, with trumped up charges on him. He has been detained for several years now. What is Britain doing about it? What are they saying about it? As far as they're concerned, the bad returns to bad rubbish. Because of course, they know what the young man is fighting about. They know what the young man, you know, is resisting. Is the continued, you know, marginalization of his people. 
The young man is fighting for justice and equality. The young man is fighting for fairness. The young man is saying, no, my people should not be treated as a conquered people. No, my people should be given, given a right of place in this country called Nigeria. No, our forefathers have died. Our children have died. I mean, our mothers were raped and all that. And we think that should be in the past now. We think we should be given a chance to run our country, our own region. The young man said, no, we're tired of federal character. I mean, where you are, we are deprived, where the, the merit, merit is, is subsumed. Yeah. Nobody wants to talk of merit again. No, you, you, you submerge merit and you bring every level of uh, mediocrity. Mediocrity. Somebody has to be given a job because he is from a certain part of the north, certain part of the region, certain part of the country. Meanwhile, the other person from another region who is highly qualified is thrown to the dustbins. It's very unfair. Kanus came out and said, no, let my people be. I think there's a lot of truth in, in what we went through. Let's remember what we went through in 1966 to 1970. Please, listen to our people. Give us a chance. Why can't we not be run for the highest country of the land? Why are we always, if we are not number three citizens, we are number five citizens. And this man was arrested and accused by the Nigerian government, you know, charged for treason, charged for, uh, you know, treason. What are we thinking together? Are you reasoning with me? Why has Britain not spoken about uh, Namda Khan? It's unfortunate, really. Very painful to me. And so when I see Britain today, you know, celebrating, uh, 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 a new election that has brought, um, you know, okay, Shamas, Stamas, uh, uh, to the to, to the vanguard of affairs as a new prime minister, and they pride themselves with uh, having an election that is free and fair. I ask myself, why does Britain not have the ambition to see this kind of things happening? A free and fair election. You know, a, a smooth succession of government or administration for its, you know, ex-colonial uh, nations. Why are you not ambitious? Why is Britain not ambitious for its children, quote and unquote? Why? Everything happening in Nigeria today is a sham. The leadership is bereft of anything, any economic, any political, any social ideas that can change this country. What we experience is fraud, 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 corruption to the highest level. What we see is monumental fraud, where leaders are, are freighting money from this country, fleecing the people dry and moving these monies overseas to buy properties, to buy private jets, to buy built houses here and there for generations yet unborn. And Britain is watching. And Britain is overseeing some of these things because some of these funds are locked up in British uh, banks. Some of these houses were bought in British lands and soils with hand and money that belongs to their former colonies. And they turn their eyes the other way. And here they are today celebrating a wonderful election, a rebirth of power and, uh, you know, a, a, a move in the right direction. So they claim about the election of uh, Keir Starmer. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's about time we begin to, you know, ask ourselves salient questions. I mean, if somebody does not want you, why do you go to them? Somebody who has shown very clearly he has made it abundantly clear to you that you are not my favorite. You are not my son. I don't want you. I've disowned you. So why do we keep running back to them? I'm sorry to say this. Britain have never impressed me. Yes, I've traveled to London a couple of times. I've moved. I've seen what it's involved. I like London. But seriously, I don't like what they do to my people. Yes, their cities are fine. It's a very beautiful uh, topography. I mean, the scenery is beautiful. You know, I love it. But hey, I wouldn't want to live there forever. Why? Because they hate my people. 
I don't know why we embrace their religion. We have taken their education and culture. We have jettisoned our own. And yet, they prefer those who don't own their religion, those who don't own their culture, and those who regard their education as Baladash. And yet, they told them, you are born to rule. And so this is my, 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 my grouse. This is my grouse. Why does Britain not want to replicate the good leadership qualities that uh, continues to happen in Britain, the smooth succession from one administration to another? Why does Britain not want to bring the accountability that you know is, is embodied in its, in its, even though written law, in its country? Why does Britain not want this to happen in Africa? Why does Britain not want Nigeria to have a free and fair election? Why is Britain suddenly eyes closed when it comes to matters that concern its citizen, Mazet Namdekano, who was kidnapped and abducted, extradited from Kenya back to Nigeria, and has since been under the, 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 the you know under extremely harsh detention continue, uh, uh, detention uh, 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 situation in Nigeria, Britain has looked the other way. America has turned and brought, lent their voice. Germany has lent their voice. Canada has lent their voice. France has lent their voice. Why has Britain not said anything? If this were a full animal today. If this were a house of full animal today, if this were a Muslim, I was held under this gulag. Believe me sincerely, I think Britain would not be as quiet as it is now. And so with all due respect to everybody, I'm sorry if I shock you. I'm sorry if I shock you, but sincerely, I'm not celebrating the new government in Britain. They might have gotten a powerful leader who is going to take them, you know, to El Dorado. They might have gotten someone who will bring things better than before. They might have got a man who will change uh, the course of British Empire, course of Britain, you know, to a far higher, greater levels. But I don't care because it does not translate anything to my people. It does not translate anything to my well-being. It does not bring anything back to Biafra land. Britain has always arrogantly shown us, yes, I don't want you. Don't need me because I will never help you. I think we should have a rethink. While we celebrate with them, we should ponder on these things. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah. Check me out, Superstars Media, uh, Lord Lugard, Blimmy Ton Lord Lugard, and it's why Flora Show, 1914 Amalgamation, it's what we dying for, three nations to one nation, ever since annihilation, nepotism, it's nonsense, you and you, clap your hand, clap your hands, Biafra gonna come, clap your hand, clap your hands, uh, Biafra, Odudua, we're free now, freedom is gonna come, we're free now. Yeah.